The following is a message from Christ Central Manchester, a church that meets in the heart of Manchester in the UK. To find out more about us, please visit www.christcentral.org.uk. So if you, um, if you don't know me, my name's Keith, I'm one of the pastors here, and it's lovely to have you with us, especially if you're a, a guest here this morning, and I hope you've just been able to feel at home and relaxed. Uh, We're going to be looking at Philippians chapter 4. We've been uh, going through Philippians, which is a book in the New Testament, which the Apostle Paul wrote to a church in Philippi, much like you and me in many ways, just without all the mobiles and automobiles and things like that. Um, Just a different era, but with the same kind of stresses of life, the same struggles, and the same answers that we find in Scripture uh, that, that sustained them, actually help them through probably more suffering and more persecution than we would uh, experience, especially in this country. But at the same time, uh, the same answers are there for them and, uh, and for us. And so we're going to read from Philippians chapter 4, where we read quite an interesting part of this book, and actually of the whole Bible. You'll see what I mean in a moment. Uh, Philippians 4 and verse 2. I plead with Yodia and I plead with Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women, since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, and with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Did you see what I mean there at the beginning of that passage? Paul's been in full flow throughout this book, talking about living uh, Christ-centered, about uh, even though the world might push in around us with its values, that we're to keep ourselves heavenly minded, that we're citizens of of heaven, not of this earth. We're kind of in the world, but not of it. Aliens in a foreign land, as it were. All these wonderful themes of the humility of Jesus in chapter 2, actually, which we'll come back to because it's very applicable. It seems like he's on this kind of kind of wonderful theological train of, of thought. And yet somehow we find him... Bang! What seems to be a bit of a sidetrack. He seems to have hit a, a roadblock in the flow of all, that he's, all these beautiful things he's talking about because he has to confront a situation where two ladies have fallen out with each other. Kind of a bit bizarre. It's a little bit, for me, it's a little bit Vicar of Dibley. It's like, why, you know, why are we suddenly worrying about the stained glass window appeal? You know, raising money to replace the stained glass window I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. I'm just saying it's, it's, it's not the glorious things that we've been reading in, in, in this chapter or, or in this book already, in, in, in the rest of Philippians. It's, it looks like a sidetrack. It looks like you're getting caught up with how are we going to look after the allotment or how are we going to, you know, some of the, if you've ever seen Vicar of Dibley, some of the silly things that they get involved in. It, it seems a bit non-essential seems a little bit like a sideline, like a sidetrack, like a, an unne- unnecessary distraction. This week I read in a, a blog by a friend of ours, a guy called Steve Tibbet, who's a pastor in London, and he talked about his first day in full-time church ministry. He left his uh, very, very nice job in sales and marketing. He'd taken an 80% pay cut to go into full-time church leadership ministry and uh, he'd, he'd put, you know, literally put his BMW company car keys on the desk, walked away from this high-powered job with a high salary and he didn't mind one bit because he was going to do the wonderful, glorious work of preaching the gospel of what he thought would be all about 
just preaching the gospel and seeing people come to know Jesus regularly. He was so excited about all of that, he didn't mind giving up all that he'd given up. His first day in full-time church leadership, paid ministry as it were, was a bit of a shock. He ended up taking a funeral and putting out the chairs himself at the beginning of the funeral. He ended up being a steward, putting out chairs and taking a funeral on his first day of glorious gospel preaching, seeing souls saved, full-time ministry that he was happy to give up this wonderful job for. It was a bit of a shock. And in this article, this blog that he writes, he quotes another guy called Pete Gregg, another pastor, who says that 85% of his time is spent behind the scenes building teams. Not preaching, pastoring, or praying, just choreographing relationships, is what this guy says. Paul, we think, is being distracted far from it. Paul sees this relational unity in the church in Philippi as important as all the glorious things that he's been mentioning already. He says we are to stand firm. And we are to stand firm in this, in the, in just in the few verses leading up to this. He says, stand firm with all the pressures of the world around you. Stand firm. And this is how you stand firm. And we, we looked at all of that. By being heavenly minded. By thinking about Jesus coming again. All these kind of things. That's how you stand firm, dear friends. But you, it's as if he's saying, if, you're gonna, if, if there's potential for you to be attacked on the external from the world around you be very careful because there's potential for you to implode there's potential for you to be destroyed internally with division disunity disgruntledness and relational breakdown and so far 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 from being a distraction or a side note this is the main this is to be seen in the mainstream of what Paul is trying to say he is choreographing relationships and making sure that they're okay, even from a distance, even through a letter. But it would have been shocking. It's a bit of a weird one for us. It would have been shocking then. Could you imagine being in that meeting when, because they would have read these letters out. These letters were written by the Apostle Paul to places like Ephesus. I was explaining to somebody earlier that if he'd, if he'd written a letter to us, it would have been the book of Mancunians or the book of Sulfordians, if that's even the right way of saying it. He... Um, it's kind of funny that we have all these books with these names. He wrote a letter to Rome. It's called the Romans book. And so he's writing to these guys. And they, what would have happened? Well, the practice would have been that they would have gathered everyone together in the church congregation and read the letter out. Could you imagine being there that day? Could you imagine being Uyodia or Syntyche? Bit awkward. Suddenly it's public that they've had a bust-up. We don't know what the bust-up was about. We would love to know, but maybe it's a good thing we don't. But in all of history and for all time, recorded in, in, in God's eternal word, is these dear ladies who've had a bust-up, who've had a disagreement and a falling out. They would have been shocked as this was read out. Their friends would have been shocked. The ones that didn't know they'd even had a falling out would have been shocked. We're part of a network called New Frontiers part of a sphere that's kind of part of that network called Christ Central Churches. And two, in both those settings, there has always been a high value on relationship, a high value on friendship, kind of strap lines. Coming out of maybe denominational Christianity in the 60s and 70s, where I think sometimes leaders felt isolated, and I'm not trying to put down any other church networks or denominations. It was like a bit of a reaction to a, a form of Christianity that didn't have a high value on relationship. And these kind of verses would have been seen as important. And actually, we aren't just all about a business-like, professional, let's get the gospel out there, and if we talk to each other on the way, then great, but it doesn't really matter. No, there's something in the, in the New Testament that's Sometimes I don't even quite understand or believe it. The way that Paul gets so emotional about his friends who he leaves behind in Ephesus on the beach, if you remember that scene in, in Acts, the way that Paul describes people like Timothy as his son, the way that Paul describes people, uh, those that he loves in the Lord, dear to him in the Lord, I miss you with the affection, or I long for you with the affection of Jesus. 
And sometimes it feels a bit, if, if one of you said that, or if I said that, it feel a bit over the top. I don't think Paul was disingenuous with it. I think he really meant it. I think he genuinely loved people. This isn't meant to be a professional, cold-hearted experience. It's meant to be relational and fun, occasionally, and, and light-hearted and joyous, because we're not... We're meant to be the ones that have the joy of the Lord. And we're meant to help each other in that. So people are struggling with to get alongside them, even if it costs us time and energy that could be spent doing the Lord's work. It's all the Lord's work. Getting alongside people is the Lord's work, as much as getting out there and preaching the gospel. And so we've been part of these networks, we are part of these networks that value these things highly. But you know, even in the busyness of building church and of going for it and of going to the nations there is a challenge for us as there would have been then to keep relationships high on our agenda does that mean we're going to be best buddies with everybody no jesus had three close friends jesus had three close friends and 12 close close friends but really close three friends if jesus could only cope with if you know what i mean in in his humanity with three close friends and 12 kind of close friends one of whom betrayed him, if that was what Jesus experienced and if that was normal for him, we aren't expecting ourselves to have 15 best buddies on this planet. I just think it's unreal. But to value friendship, deep ones like the three that Peter had, sorry, Jesus had with Peter, James and John, or the other nine, we are to value friendship, look for it, and not just say, oh, well, that leader doesn't befriend me, so they don't really value friendship in this church or in this network. Do you hear what I'm saying? We can be like that. They don't seem very friendly to me, and therefore I think this strap line of friendship and relationship just seems like a bit of an empty strap line and a bit of a hoax. Now, actually, I can't be everybody's best friend in this room, And nor can you be everybody else's best friend. But I want to value you, even if I don't get to know you that well. I want to be interested in you. I want to spend time. I want to spend energy. And likewise, hopefully we do that with each other. And if you become best friends with somebody and you get two or three best friends here, great. That's what this is about. But it's also about valuing each other. It's also about, when it comes to it, recognising that you've fallen out with someone. Sometimes it can happen quite subtly and you, you just get a little bit of animosity towards someone. You think, why am I thinking like that about them? What have they done? Oh, they did that thing last week and it really annoyed me. I've just not thought about it very much. Sometimes, let me give you a little bit of a flow diagram right now. It's not going to be on the screen, but this is how we are to process according to Jesus in Matthew 18 and other verses in the New Testament. If someone's annoyed you, this got to a point where they'd annoyed each other or they'd fallen out these dear ladies that were publicly and forever recorded in the New Testament. Well, thank God the Bible's finished. None of us can end up in the same store. <laughs> they would got to this point where they needed other people to help. So Paul says, would you fellow... These were godly Christian women as well. Just let me say that they weren't horrible women. These had served alongside Paul, he said. These were, these were good people. Godly women. They had a big disagreement about something. Again, we'd love to know what. But listen, this is that they'd got so far down the flow chart that they needed external help. For a moment, let's just imagine you've had a little bit of an animosity towards someone. There's a little bit of bitterness. They did something last week that slightly annoyed you. They gave you the cold shoulder or whatever it is, or they just were a little bit arrogant or whatever. Can you forgive them and let, as one verse puts it, love cover a multitude? of sins and let it let it go if the answer is yes beautiful job done god I forgive them pray god i forgive them for being a numpty or whatever saying a stupid word being un, un, unhelpful being unfeeling towards me insensitive towards me i forgive them there's no point for me to go don't make the mistake of forgiving them in your heart having no issue with them and then three years later raising it with saying and saying to them, oh yeah, do you know I forgave you for that? Sorry, what? 
For, what do you mean? You forgave me for what? Yeah, I forgave you for that. I didn't want to mention it, but I'll mention it now anyway. You're just digging the whole thing up. If, it, if you've dealt with it there, leave it. If you can't deal with it there, if you feel like this is too big, I need to just raise it with them. Maybe it's a character issue that they need to hear about. I want to do it well. Forgive them first. Then go to them and say, do you know what? That was a bit hurtful what you did there. And then forgive them again to their face. If that creates a big ding-dong, as I put it, which is a theological term, <laughs> that creates a big issue and we end up with an issue like this, then you can ask some, for some help. Get one or two others along. Matthew 18 is a really good process. I'm basically following the flow chart of Matthew 18. Get somebody else involved to help. Now, you could be a married couple and get to a point where you need help. Do it. Get help. We can't get past this issue. She thinks this. I think that. Can't get past it. But it might not be a marriage. It just could just be any friendship, relationship. And you're just not getting on. Or, as with this situation, they haven't gone looking to help. They've needed somebody else to say, will you get involved and help these two ladies? Because this isn't working. And this is so important, the whole church could split over. You know, eventually, this sort of division, and I just want to raise that again. If we aren't careful about relationships, churches can split. They have done, they will continue sadly to do, unless we get this right. So, if you can forgive them, forgive them and let love cover a multitude. If it wasn't that big a deal for you, just forgive them and move on. If you need to just raise it with them because it was a big enough deal to do that, do it. Then forgive them, then move on. If you can't forgive them and move on, if it's just a bit of an impasse, get help. And then hopefully, applying what Paul has applied, I believe, to, this cup, to this, these two ladies, we'll get there. What Paul says to them is this, agree with each other. That's a bit simplistic, Paul. That's the whole point. They've got a disagreement. How can you say agree with each other? There's a kind of like-mindedness. Paul's talking about, and he's talked about it previously, be of the same thinking, not vote the same politi- political party, not you know, think that the same car brand is brilliant or the same sports team. No, not be brain-dead, robotic, all thinking the same things. Even have little disagreements over theology. Hopefully not the virgin birth, hopefully not the resurrection. But even have a little bit of a dis- difference of opinion. But on this thing, would you come together with some like-mindedness? That's what Paul's getting at. Come together with... Realise you're coming at this thing from the same starting place. You both love Jesus. You're both in this thing together. You've both served him for years. Would you even... And I think this is where Philippians 2 is slightly driven from. Philippians 2, at the beginning, that we've been here already... It talks about the attitude of Jesus, the humility of Jesus. If these two ladies just went through Philippians 2, remember in the congregation they would have just heard it fresh off the press and then heard their names and then gone bright red and horrified. But if they go back and just apply these couple of verses at the beginning of chapter 2, if they just do that, I think it would, I, I, I believe probably 100% of relationships get sorted out the minute you go through Philippians 2, verse 1 to 4. At least 99.999. If they were to do this, do nothing out of selfish ambition. So if they were to come at each other with a selflessness, that meant I'm not fighting my corner and my ambitions, consider each other better than yourself. That's huge. If they come at each other assuming that they know best and that they are more important, it's going nowhere. If they come to each other believing genuinely that I might be in the wrong and they might have got this right and I might have misinterpreted all that went on. Guys, I'm spending some time on this this morning and I realise that. That's how important this is. It's important it was for Paul. It's important it is for us. If we, if we come to each other assuming they are, be- they are better that they know better, that they might be more in the right, and that I might have got it wrong. It changes everything. It's a bit like Christian football if it ever went like this. Christians playing football against each other, no one should ever touch the ball. No, after you. No, please. After It was, should be the most boring sport. Some of you might think football already is. I beg to disagree. 
But that's okay, we can have that little disagreement. <laughs> but that's almost what we're looking at here. Assuming the other one is better. Have, and this is the killer, have the same attitude as Jesus. If they, who humbled himself from the glory of heaven, and we then read on, died on a cross in our place. If we have the same attitude of Jesus, it's like, do this, do this, do this, have the same attitude of Jesus. It, that's what I mean. If, you, if we did have that attitude, even with biggest disagreements, 100% of them should be sorted out just because of that process of coming at each other or coming to each other with these attitudes. Once we've done all that, where can there be a disagreement? Oh, well, I thought that you should have done this when you were doing the notices or the children's work. I thought actually the way that you said that to me about um, whether I should come around your house or what time we should meet, I thought you were just a bit, a bit insensitive. I've got so much going on. Hang on a minute. Really? In the light of those verses in chapter 2. Friends, Paul goes here, spends some time here, spends some verses here. I think it's motivated by the concern that there is disunity in that church. That's where he's coming from in Philippians 2 a little bit, I think. None of this is ever in a vacuum. It's not just a theological treatise. He knows the issues in that church. Thank God we've got this disagreement in Philippi in one way. We get to hear how important it is that we're united, that we're of one thinking. That one thinking like Jesus is thinking. Man, if every Christian had Jesus' attitude, where would there ever be an issue? Where would there ever be a problem in the church? I just want to commend this church at this point. I was thinking about this this week as I was preparing. and I just had a conversation with somebody this week that just bowled me over. Excuse me. We're in a, we're in a church uh, that's in the city centre and that means people come and go a little bit and we say goodbye and that's sad and I welled up when we were saying goodbye to the Stacys and people move on for various reasons, usually good. And uh, sometimes that can get difficult. But it's the nature of a city centre church or a city-wide church as we're aiming to be more and more. But I want to just say to you guys that are part of this church, and you know you are, that it is a real privilege to serve you and lead you and serve Jesus alongside you. And one or two of the conversations I've had recently just blow me away. The level of maturity in this room, the level of, of hunger for the things of God. They are, it's so much easier to lead a church when people are hungering after him than if they're just you know, passive or dry. I just want to say, this is such a privilege to be in this church and to serve God alongside you. Let's not stop and let's not belittle the need to get relationships right. Whether they're deep friendships or more shallow, you know, in the, in the correct sense, they're not quite as deep friendships. Let's just make sure we get things right and honour people, think the best of people, that's the first thing this morning, the, the, the importance of friendship. Second thing is that we are to live well. Paul then moves on to talk about rejoicing and knowing peace. And he's not, talk, often the Bible will address us corporately, but here he's kind of, Paul's addressing us corporately, but as individuals who make up the corporate, he's very much targeting individuals. He's saying, as you lead your lives, rejoice, no joy. No joy deep down, whatever your circumstances are. Don't worry, and I love this, because he absolutely goes for it. He says, rejoice. And just in case there's somebody there that's listening to this letter being read out, who's really going for it and can't rejoice, Paul, excuse me, you've got to be kidding me. I can't rejoice. You don't know what I'm going through. I think he's writing this from prison, which kind of trumps probably most other situations. And in case there's anyone in the room that says to Paul at the time or to this letter being read out, Paul, sorry mate, I can't rejoice, no chance. It's too difficult. He says, I say it again, just in case. 
Rejoice. And then he says, the Lord is near. And then he says these kind of final total words. He says, not just in a few things, in everything, pray, ask God, thank God. In everything, pray. In everything, ask God. In everything, thank God. Don't be anxious. Rather, ask him. If you're anxious about something, don't just sit in anxiety. Don't just wallow in anxiety. Pray, and I'm talking to myself as much as I am to you. If you feel anxious, ask him to help you. Anxiety is useless. It doesn't change anything, right? Praying will... Being anxious about something that you can change is stupid, because just go and change it. Being anxious about something that you can't change is stupid, because being anxious won't change it. So Jesus says, do not worry. Oh, it's easy for you to say, Jesus. You're kind of God and man. Nobody's telling us, don't worry. If anyone had anything to worry about, Jesus did. He had the cross looming over him in his life. And I still don't quite know, and I don't think anyone quite knows when it was he, re- he discovered that he was going to be dying that kind of death. Imagine having that hanging over you. At some point... He could have been the most troubled and worry-filled man on this planet that had ever lived. He knew he was going to die in the most painful form of torturous death that's ever been invented. The Romans came up with an incredible form of, of torture and capital punishment. Paul says, in everything, don't be anxious, pray. And then verse 7, peace comes. Peace comes. When you pray, when you give stuff to him, peace comes. And peace isn't this airy fairy airy, airy thing. Peace, he says, will stand guard. Peace will come along and stand guard. Like a centurion, standing in front of your heart and mind, it says. Guarding your heart and mind so that you will walk with Jesus. Peace will come to, to protect your walk with Jesus. That's beautiful, isn't it? Peace is going to stand guard as you do these things in everything. Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything. It's like Paul just leaves nothing out. You can't come up with a scenario that means you're allowed to be anxious. In everything, don't be anxious about anything and in everything. And then when you do that, peace will come along and stand guard and say, you're not coming past. I'm protecting, I'm peace by the way, and I'm protecting that person's heart and mind so they can keep walking with Jesus. Paul is concerned here with Christians and how we feel deep down. How we go through life together. And friends, what's on offer here is the normal Christian life. When we get close to worrying, pray. Thank God. Go to him. Ask him. Then we will know joy, rejoicing, not anxiety. Jesus promised trouble. Did you know that? He says you will have trouble in this life. It's always one of the most beautiful verses. No promise of an easy life from Jesus. But here is a promise of peace. Whatever your circumstances, peace that stands on God. Then, not finally, as it says in some versions, but actually almost the same train of thought, Paul says, next, think about good things. Don't fill your minds with rubbish. Let your thought patterns be about healthy, godly, pure, worthy, admirable, lovely things. We don't have to be plagued by sinful thinking of the more obvious kind, you know, that person really annoys me, or lustful thinking, or bitter thinking. But we also don't have to be plagued by low, negative, condemnatory thoughts about, about ourselves. We're not even to live like that. I heard it recently that we say, hundred, we say hundreds and thousands of words to ourselves daily. We don't even realise sometimes we're saying them. Subconsciously. Another friend of mine talks about the tapes that we have. He's a bit old fashioned, he thinks in cassette tapes. That, that, that we have a cassette recorder in our head, and 
the, the, the tapes we listen to on a daily basis, sometimes they're, they're not great. Sometimes they need changing. We need to change the, 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 the thinking, the, the things we're saying to ourselves. And here Paul is saying, don't dwell on those old tapes, those old thoughts of, oh, you've blown it again. Why did you say that? You might need to pick yourself up for, for saying the wrong thing, but don't then linger there. Change the tapes. God, I know I blew it, but thank you. I'm your son, I'm your daughter, and you died for me. And I'm to know peace, not anxiety. Holy Spirit, come alongside me. He is the paraclete, the one who comes alongside, the counselor, the one who befriends us and coaches us. We're not to listen to negative, condemnatory thoughts anymore. We're new creations with the Holy Spirit in and alongside us. So don't think boastful, bitter, lustful, envious thoughts. And don't think how rubbish I am thoughts. And this is a challenge. And this is a challenge for people that have been Christians for decades and for people that have been Christians for five minutes. And sometimes Christians that have been Christians for five minutes have got this down, and people that have been Christians for decades haven't, just because of life and the stuff that's come at them. We can live with the wrong tapes going around in our heads. We can live with saying the wrong th- thousands of words a day to ourselves. I don't know how we do this exactly, but the Bible talks about taking captive thoughts. So if you hear yourself saying, yeah, did it again, you're useless. Why do you always get it wrong? Change the thought. Take it, bin it. Think about him. Think about all that he would say of you. Be blown away again. Pray, if, you don't want to, if you don't know what to pray, pray this. Thank you, God. The minute you feel low, right? If you've got no idea what you would do, just do this. The minute you feel low, the minute you feel self-condemned, Thank you, Jesus, that I am your, or thank you, Father, that I am your approved son or daughter. Just say it. Thank you, I'm your approved son or daughter. Just say it to him. It it immediately focuses you on your position in heavenly places. It talks about Ephesians. We're already seated with him in this incredible way. It already takes you to your adopted, beautiful identity in God the Father. You are a beloved child of God. And we sometimes just need to remind ourselves, and we often need to remind ourselves if we are living with these tapes of self-condemnation. Lastly, I want to just jump back to where Paul says, let your gentleness be evident. So rejoice... Let your gentleness be evident. This word epikaya is this word gentleness. Other translations call it long-suffering or reasonableness. It kind of falls short of what's trying to be said. I would call it extra mile people. Going the, Jesus talked about if someone asks you to go a mile, go a mile again. If someone slaps you in the face, off from the other cheek. Going beyond... the. Letter of the law, going beyond the letter of the law might be a a really helpful way of, let your gentleness, that means you're not going to necessarily dish it out the way that they deserve. It's beyond justice. It's forgiveness wrapped grace. It's the stories of forgiveness from places like South Africa at the the end of apartheid where, where incredible sins were written off. And Nelson Mandela led that country in that way. It's that kind of stuff. It's the and we're not even 100 percent sure what Nelson Mandela's position in terms of God and and that what, but he did something that is very, very Christian, very, very New Testament. And exactly this verse right here. An incredible gentleness that went beyond any bitterness of all the mistreatment that he had suffered. Do you remember the one the, the story where the lady's brought before Jesus where she's been caught in adultery. And the guys that have, done, have, that have caught her are trying to trick Jesus and that's their motive. But 
Jesus kind of puts that to one side and deals with this lady with gentleness, extra mile thinking, forgiveness, wrapped grace. And he says, well, he says you, you're forgiven. He treats her in this incredible way. This word, gentleness, epikaya, it's when we see beyond the annoying person that's in front of us. It's when we see beyond the wrong, the, the wrong words that they are saying to us. It's when we see past the snottiness that they are presenting. It's when we see with God's eyes a person who is in need of the extra mile and they just don't know it. They might not ever realise it or thank us for it, but we still go, it, we go for it anyway. It's that bucket of love when all you want to do is kick them. It's, it's the mark of Christianity when we treat people like that. They don't deserve it. And actually, sometimes it's knowing when to act like this. Because sometimes we just need to be firm. Sometimes we just need to handle a situation in a, in a more kind of straight down the line way. But if you live a life where you are just always treating somebody correctly, oh, well, they did this, so they deserve that. Well, Jesus was presented with this Old Testament truth of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And he said, love your enemies. And he said other things about going extra miles, turning the cheek, the other cheek when you've been hit already. If someone takes a piece of your clothing, give them all of your clothing, as it were. It, Jesus, it was hard to live with. This is what it, and do you know what it comes out? It comes out for us from knowing that we have never been treated as we deserved. If we treat people as they don't deserve, and we sometimes feel a kind of gear crunch in our hearts. I can't believe I'm doing this. They've just said, they've just sworn at me and I'm giving them a cup of coffee. I can't even believe I'm doing this. She's just railroaded me in this meeting at work. She's just sidelined me, treated me horribly, and yet I am choosing not to badmouth her to our colleagues behind her back. I am choosing to give her such a bucket of love and grace that she does not deserve. She deserves for us to moan about her and I'm not going to do it and I don't quite like it. We were not treated as we deserved. That's where it comes from. Knowing that I was not treated as I deserved. If I was treated as I deserved, I would have hung on a cross for my sins myself. Thank God he never treated me as I deserved. And same for you. So joy, nearness to God, no anxiety. The antidote to anxiety is prayer bringing our requests before him. Do you know, sometimes it feels stupid bringing your requests before God because you think, well, God, you already know this. I've said this before. You're not informing him like it's news. It's not for his sake, it's for your sake. God, I just want to tell you how I feel about this. I know you know, but I need to tell you. She is doing my head in. This situation is annoying. I feel terrible about what I said. I feel really anxious, God. Tell him. Tell him. Don't ever not, don't ever think, I'll just, I'll keep a stiff upper lip. You know, God knows, I'll just grin and bear it. No, that isn't what we're supposed to do. What we're supposed to do is tell him, bring it. Bring it to him, whatever it is. And peace will then guard our hearts. Peace can't guard your heart if you've not opened your heart. That's the point. Peace can't guard your heart if you've never said, God, help. There's no way in for peace. Peace that then would transcend all understanding. I love that. We've not even touched on this yet. Peace, this peace that stands guard, 
There's two things about this piece that transcends all understanding. You won't ever be able to muster this piece up in your own thinking. That's the first thing. But also, it won't always make sense that you feel peaceful. It goes beyond the norm. It goes beyond understanding in the sense that I shouldn't feel peaceful right now. I've just lost my job. I feel peaceful. What? How? She's just left me. He's just abandoned me. They've just said this horrible thing to me. I've just crashed my car. Whatever it might be. And then we are flooded with peace. And we say, this doesn't make any sense. But thank God, this is the kind of peace we're talking about. That it transcends what should be normal for us. And then out of all of that, walking with God, out of all of that, knowing him, and all, out of all of that peace, this incredible gentleness can come forth where we are like Jesus to people. And sometimes we do stuff that blows them away. Sometimes we do stuff that should blow them away and they don't even, they're not even grateful, they don't even re- realise it. They don't even realise just how much of a nice person you've just been to them. You want to stick two fingers up, but you don't. I've just... I've just given you an absolute break, a massive break, and you haven't even recognised it. God bless you. (laughs) That's gritted teeth, just in case you didn't. (coughs) Extra mile Christians, I love that. (sighs) Easier said than done, I know, but it, it comes out of this walk with him.